kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to a spanktastic edition of Star Wars in Review. It's the only podcast that will give you all sorts of advice, warranted or not, wanted or not, needed or not. Over there is my better podcasting half, the man who once hit me in the head with a roller hockey puck, and that's Luke Neitzel. On this side of the table, it's your favorite milk jug, Maya Madrid. Every so often, we're going to get together, talk over Star Wars news, answer your serious, kid seriously questions, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel, how are you? I'm good. I had a good week. Did you? Well, not, well, it was a busy week for work. I think we're both in the same situation, even though we have vastly different jobs, of this week being ridiculously long and insane. But at least on Tuesday, I, I got to take a little bit of time with my replacement, Maya, my buddy Jim, who lives oh, like... That guy. I hate yeah, that guy. <laughs> you've never met him, but yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. He's my, he's my nemesis. But he's just like you, but he lives two minutes away instead of 20. So, And he's super into board games, so we had a board game night. So he's... Ten times the cooler friend. So well, so the map works. these are the trade-offs. He's two minutes away, and he's super into the games, which is really fun, but he doesn't like sports at all. Like, he doesn't like any teams or leagues or what, so that whole giant chunk of my life gets cut out with him. So, you have some sticking value, apparently. Yeah, I still don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get to the news. <laughs> Sounds like John Favreau. Everybody's favorite swinger, aside from Vince Vaughn, is lined up to do the writing and producing on the new Star Wars live action show. While details on the actual sub- subject matter are scarce, we do know that this is a job that Favreau has coveted for a long time. Mix in a big hit in the form of the Jungle Book, and it's easy to see why Kathleen Kennedy felt comfortable with this hire. But not so fast, because not everybody is so happy. Under recent criticism for the lack of diversity in high-profile Star Wars jobs, the decision to announce this hiring, especially especially on International Women's Day, was met with jeers from the internet. On this show, we've talked quite a bit about the need for more voices in Star Wars, and in her own words, Kennedy seems to be trying to head off the criticism. Uh, this is a quote uh, from her. This series will allow John the chance to work with a diverse group of writers and directors and give Lucasfilm the opportunity opportunity to build a robust talent base luke do you like john favreau do you support this decision do you support the timing name one good thing he's written ever since swingers and why in the hell did they announce this on international women's day your thoughts well i i'm okay with him i i think he can Can we just stop can we just stop the show i forgot to say something and this Okay, we'll get back to it. And I know that's what everybody wants to, to hear. But we need to talk about Everyone Old Boy. Everyone wants to hear my thoughts yeah, on John, John Favreau. Favreau. But we need to talk about oh, Old Boy. Oh, did you watch it? I watched half of it. Which and half? I got to the part when he is in the long hallway that they used in Daredevil. And that you talk for an hour and a half about how it was this big, huge ripoff. And they are similar. But it is very directly an homage. It is not a copycat. And I just wanted to get that out of the system. Because I had to listen to you go on and on when I watched Daredevil. One of my favorite shows about how you couldn't watch it because it was a ripoff of Old Boy. And... It wasn't. Super. What do you think about John Favreau? <laughs> uh, he's fine. He's he's real hit or miss. Uh, he's you know I mean he he directed Iron Man. I I find Elf enjoyable though not as more people like it than I do. But it, it's a good time. Oh, and I I liked the Jungle Book too. I thought that was that was entertaining for what it is. But he's also directed Young Sheldon and <laughs> uh, Cowboys versus Aliens, Iron Man two. Uh, so I'm not willing to to say that I I think he's a sure thing by any standards. I think it's a really uninspired, safe choice. It's not interesting. It doesn't bring diversity like they've talked about wanting to do. The timing of it is tone deaf. Obviously, with having it be International Women's Day, which with Me Too going on, it, it seems just really tone deaf to to do it this way. They could have announced it some other time and. Um, hopefully that means that they, they really do hire diverse writers and directors, but at this point you have to show me you can do that before I give you the benefit of the doubt because they haven't done that to this point. Here's what I don't understand. He's being brought in as a producer and a writer, and then they talk about having a group, a diverse group of writers. So maybe like he's the head writer, the showrunner, and there's going to be people under him. I really hope that this was the conversation between Reed Moreno and Kathleen Kennedy a few weeks ago. And 
I keep trying to give Disney the benefit of the doubt, but it's a lot like like my Republican friends who are like, no, no, our party's not racist. We're just about freedom. And then bad things keep happening, and bad things keep happening, and bad things keep happening. And like, at what point are they actually going to start looking at diversity? I don't know. I mean, I I think, it, like you said, it's a safe pick, but I've been really underwhelmed by a lot of what he's done. A lot of people give him so much credit for Iron Man, and you but know, if you, you listen to the making of on that, they didn't even have a script, and they were just kind of making it up as they oh really they went along. Yeah, they they were. Jeff Bridges has some interviews where he talks about how they they hadn't completed the script when they started shooting it. They just started kind of doing whatever, and they didn't know where they were going, which also might explain why his character just goes insane for no reason and and changes over. But yeah, it's it's I think uninspired is the, the best way to to put it. I don't know. If we come off as underwhelmed. It's because we are. Yeah, I, it's it's hard to get excited for him doing it. I mean. To take a chance, try something. Especially, you're in the same company as Marvel, right. you know, and Marvel's finally doing some diversity there. With, you know, you you have Black Panther right now crushing it with an all African American cast, except for two minor supporting characters and an African American director. You saw what Warner Brothers did with Patty Jenkins and Wonder Woman. Why wouldn't you want to bring that into the Star Wars thing? And until they say it, it's it's lip service. Or until they do it. You got any feelings about it being on the Disney streaming thing? It's, I mean, that's more money that you're going to have to buy the subscription to that and that whole bit. Well, we'll see. I mean, I, in, in the one aspect, like, am I pumped about buying another streaming service? I don't have cable, so I do everything through Roku. So I buy, for, I buy Netflix and I buy Hulu and I buy sports packages. So having to add to that isn't something I'm particularly excited about, but Disney has a lot of great content. So maybe it replaces some of those. Maybe I don't need those. And I'm looking at the new ESPN plus that's going to launch. That is only going to be $5 a month for now. But if they do the same thing with the Disney app and I'm able to get all of ESPN and all of the Disney stuff and it's, you know, $20 combined a month, I'm okay with that. And it makes sense to me that you're going to want to put premium content on there because you want people to buy it. So regardless of my feelings, I don't think anyone can be taken aback that they're going to hold off on the Star Wars stuff and not just make it free ABC shows. Yeah. I mean, I think we should more be grateful that we got Clone Wars and we got Rebels on networks that we could watch. I think that there's also, you know, this is the reason that they bought Fox, if you listen to some sources. It wasn't really, you know, they wanted the, the X-Men. It was that they wanted their vast library to put so that they could compete with Netflix. And if it is something that is actually going to compete with Netflix, like Amazon Video. Amazon Video, at first, I was kind of like, eh, do I really want to invest in this? But then, you know, Prime is such a good good deal, it's, it makes sense. If this is going to be of the quality of Netflix and of Amazon Prime, then I think it's going to be well, well worth the money. And, and then that way, maybe it's a way that I can actually watch Rebels, which I don't know. Yeah, well, and now that Rebels is done, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get it on some of these platforms because clone wars is still on netflix and a lot of the marvel movies are still on netflix and it sounds like even when the disney app launches i believe they said that the the marvel creative tv shows on netflix are going to stay there so yeah. daredevil jessica jones all those things are still going to be on netflix so may, maybe we'll get lucky and rebels will come out before the switch we'll see yeah we're enthusiastic today we, well, didn't, we didn't drink and maybe we got enough sleep so <laughs> I did not get enough sleep. I'm still uh -oh. equally as tired. Uh -oh. you're, you're... I'm I'm la I'm more sober. Are you? <laughs> Last time, yes. All right. Should we talk about the other news? In plagiarism news, there's something fishy about the posters for the new Han Solo movie. A few weeks ago, Disney released some really cool looking Solo posters that mixed a retro feel with popping colors. One for each of the four main characters: Han, Lando, Kira, and Chewbacca. There's just one problem. These designs are pretty much exactly like four album covers the French artist Hakim Bauhaus did. It might be Bauhaus. Uh, he's French. Uh, he did them for Sony. And Sony he's is not Japanese. listening anyway, so it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, at first, there was a thought that maybe Disney talked to Sony and maybe bought the rights. And then the, uh, the uh, artist just didn't know. But then Disney said they essentially subbed out the work and they were looking into it. Bauhaus has since taken down the original message. Luke, what in the hell is going on with this film? 
Oh, I, I don't I don't think you can blame the film or anything. This is just an homage. It's totally <laughs> different. We've already covered this earlier in the show. They're just they're that being is, definitely bullshit. an homage, but it's not taking the same thing at all. It's it's different, and I applaud them for paying homage to something great. So it's a movie poster. Oh, I don't I don't really care. Go and watch Old Boy. Everybody who listens to this, all four people who listen to this, go watch Old Boy. Maybe you should get finish it two, before you. No, you come I'm gonna anyway. get the two thirds whatever part I I watched. And then watch that fight scene and watch the Daredevil scene and let us know if you think it was a blatant ripoff. Uh, this I, is a blatant ripoff. I mean, it's pretty much... Have you seen the photos? Yeah, okay. I, it is. Give the guy some money and move on. I mean, it's posters. I, I don't think it's that much to be worked up about, I th- unless you're him. And I think that uh, Disney can afford to, to pay a licensing fee to just move on and, and keep them up because they do look nice. That's the smart way to go. And I... And I thankful that you're so level-headed about this i want to know the whole story and i don't think we're going to get it i think disney's going to bury this like and and then the back (laughs) all right i think they're gonna they're gonna totally like this is just gonna disappear and i really hate that i think that that first han solo image the one that came out of russia that was leaked i think that one was real oh i I agree yeah hurried up to try to to try to like figure this out so they subbed it out and somebody was under a ton of pressure because holy crap disney's actually giving us money we better do this right what do i do i don't know what to do oh let's just do this yeah and because that's in my experience that's a lot of uh, that's often how plagiarism sort of works is when you're crunch for time well and you wonder too not that i'm making excuses but do you see something and you subconsciously take it in and then regurgitate it i mean these are a little too matter of fact too, probably right. to to say that but i just want to know <laughs> We'll be in the book in <laughs> 10 years. Let's talk about Kid Serious, Seriously Kid questions. Last week, you and I put up a Twitter survey to decide once and for all who would make the better entry into the Star Wars universe, Halloran, from The Shining or The Kool-Aid Man. Oh, yeah. The responses were pretty much bullshit, and I refuse to talk about them anymore. Here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in any event, we have a follow-up regarding Pat from KC. Oh, a now, random listener. Yeah. Now, Luke... If you remember from last week, we were really excited to get a letter from someone we were at least decently sure was a real-life human being that we did not know. Yet at the same time, we were at least a little worried that one of our friends was trolling us. Well, we got a response. Mark. From... Yeah, it could have been Mark. <laughs> uh, well, well that, was a, that was what we probably would have bet if we had to. <laughs> we got a message from our friend in Casey. Pat writes, I'm 16 and thinking of trying to podcast with my amigo. We both like movies and stuff. Any advice to start out? I've emailed a lot of shows like you guys, and people usually don't reply. Thanks a bunch. Oh. So this might actually be real. Right. Well, hey, Pat. Thanks for listening, and, and good luck for you guys. And his question was he wanted advice on how to start. Um, yeah, you mean read it slower? What's the difference? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> uh, so you want advice from us, which is a little scary, but um, we'll, we'll do our best. Hopefully you get advice from people a little more qualified. What I would say is a a couple of things. First is do not spend a lot of your money to start out on this. You may read articles and see things that tell you you need to buy expensive microphones and software and all these things. We we found free software. Uh, When we first started practicing, we used the mic that was just built into my computer. We later purchased a mic, but we didn't spend a lot on it. I got it on discount uh, over Christmas sale time. So don't spend a lot of your money right away on this wait and practice and and get it down make sure you're you're doing something that you're interested in and that you you like and is in your voice don't try to copy someone else and i think that's something we're still learning a little bit as we go is just trying to be comfortable and be ourselves because if you start imitating people i think it'll it'll show and then the last thing i would say is try to uh, read as much as you can or look up YouTube videos. There's lots of things you can do. Uh, how we learned to edit and do sound and put pictures in was by Googling YouTube videos that said, you, how do I make this specific microphone work? How do I make this specific audio editing program work? I'm making typing motions with my hands while I do this, which is fun. But you can Very find terrible. a lot of free resources on the internet that you can watch and, and, and read about that'll help give you advice on, on how to do the technical things and then also how to craft a show and, and stuff like that. And, you know, once you start recording stuff, feel free to email it over to us. It would be really fun to hear. So good luck, buddy. Uh, I have two points of advice, Pat. The first thing I'd say is don't do it for money, do it for fun. 
Uh, we haven't made a penny off of this, and, and we may never, and I still think it was absolutely worth it. And it always will be worth it, because we're doing this because it's a fun way for us to hang out, talk shit to each other, and just enjoy something that we both enjoy, that we can talk about for a long time, which is Star Wars. The other thing that I would recommend is there is a YouTuber out there with a lot of experience in this field, and his name is John Campia, C-A-M-P-E-A, and he did a video called Getting Started. So if you YouTube John Campia, Getting Started, he has a wonderful sort of step-by-step tutorial almost on how to get yourself sort of up and running. And um, that was, you know, I watched John Campia's show a lot, so that's why I heard him talking about it. And that's how I found it, but I thought that that was really helpful. Let's move to the Clone Wars. Season 1, Episode 7, Duel of the Droids. You hold on to friends by keeping your heart a little softer than your head. <laughs> the most ridiculous blue font. <laughs> yes. Wait, say that again for us. You hold on to your friends by keeping your heart a little softer than your head. God, I hope I wrote that down right because it sounds ridiculous that as I does, reread it. Really, it doesn't even fit the. It doesn't really apply to the episode that much either. Rob Coleman and George Christick tag team once again to finish off this two-parter as Anakin Skywalker, Ahsoka, and a small group of clone troopers race to prevent R2 from being forced to reveal the secrets of the Republic and suffer certain death at the hands of General Grievous. Luke, take it away. So when we open in this one, R2 has been captured. Gnacked, who is the... Is uh, that the guy's name? Yeah, I, 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 watched, I turned the subtitles on so I, I can actually I see it spelled. I usually do and I didn't this time. Yeah, so Gnacked is the bounty, well, not even bounty hunter, Junker, yeah, it's, who's it's, it's, captured R2 and is going to sell him to General Grievous because R2 has all of the battle plans for the Republic in his memory because they haven't wiped him out. The Republic believes that R2's probably dead, so instead they're going to try to find a secret listening base that Grievous, they believe Grievous has where he's intercepting their messages. So Anakin, Ahsoka, Rex, and his team of clones are headed out to try and find that, but Anakin believes R2 is still alive. R2 on Gannat's ship is locked in a closet, basically, um, with no restraining bolts or anything. They locked him in a closet. But he's able to saw through a panel and briefly release a signal telling where he is that R2 or that Anakin is able to hear, and they try to get our, our replacement R2, R3, or Goldie to boost the signal. But weirdly, stubby. Also stubby. or stubby too as well, if you don't like him, weirdly, 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 because he's having a lot of technical problems over these two issues, he uh, loses the signal rather than amplifying it. But they get enough to find a coordinate, so they decide to take all over there, saying that it might be the listening base anyway, so they should check it out. Plus, Anakin really only cares about finding R2. He does not give a shit about the listening base at all. He gives as much a shit about the listening base as Obi-Wan gives about R2 in, <laughs> in these two episodes. Because Obi-Wan's like, no, don't bother with it. So they they fly off there. Ganax lands on Grievous's listening base, which is in this kind of... You only see it in the atmosphere, but it's this kind of cool orangish glow planet that he's on. And they have a battle sphere, which is one of the center spheres of the Trade Federation ships just kind of floating in the atmosphere, and that is what they're using as their listening base. It looks very much like a Death Star. It does. It does. But he lands on that and gives R2 to Grievous, and they basically pull R2 apart. Like, yeah, I was a little surprised a when little I saw him. They had grotesque. His legs are completely taken off. His head cylinder or half cylinder is separated from his body. Uh, they have him all ripped apart, and they're going through him, and they find all the battle plans in there. And this is a little bit of a surprise to me that took me off guard. Is Gannat then asked for more money and Grievous straight up murders him from behind with yes. his lightsaber? My daughter was like, "Whoa!" Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, it was yeah. a green lightsaber right through the chest, and you're like, "Wow!" It's... It, it was a crazy tone shift because the last episode of this arc was so goofy and lighthearted and whatnot that I was just—if you would have done this in uh, rookies, I would have understood it. 
or seen it coming a little bit more, but this was kind of out of the blue. They just yeah. straight up murdered him. Dude, Grievous is really scary in this. We're going to talk is... more about it later, but this is legit the, yeah. the, the, the Grievous you've wanted to this see. This is a bad, badass villain in this yeah. one. So Obi-Wan, or uh, Anakin and, and his team fly to the planet, and they get there. And signal Obi Wan, and Obi Wan's plan is we'll just send in a bunch of battle cruisers and blow it up. And uh, Obi Wan's not there either; he's communicating through a hologram. Typical, uh, but, typical, typical Obi Wan. <laughs> but freaking armchair Jedi. But they know that do our this Anakin. Don't exactly. give a shit about this Anakin. I'm well, just going to judge doing? you. I'm just sitting in Coruscant, chilling. <laughs> but but anyway, uh, Anakin what tells him dick. that R two is there, knowing they need to act because they'll get the plans out if they wait any longer, and then they can broadcast him to t- whoever. So, Anakin suggests, well, we'll go in and rescue R2. And Obi-Wan's like, no, just sneak in and kill everything. That's that's what Obi-Wan wants them to do. So they agree to do that, but obviously Anakin's not going to kill everything. So they sneak Cause, on. Because Anakin's the good guy, and Obi-Wan's the bad guy. Pr- pretty much. Pretty much. So they sneak onto this battle sphere, and they immediately split up. Ahsoka takes Rex and the clone troopers to go plant bombs in the core of the ship to blow it up. And Anakin gets really pissed off at her because she gets all dangerous on it. And this is an important part. He decides to split them up. Oh, immediately. He dumps them immediately. And there's some other things that I think are funny that we'll touch back on. But uh, Anakin then goes off to find R2. And we see that the clone troopers and Ahsoka are trying to open a door. They're trying to get Goldie to open a door. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's just not working for whatever reason. And then, then a bunch of battle droids show up. A big fight ensues. The shocking reveal that we've been building to for so long that I never saw coming. R3, our friend, Goldie, is in league with General Grievous. He is a spy in, droid. In league, like, like they... Wait, what? He, yeah, I know. It's it's hard to accept. We never saw it coming. So, he's a traitor. We what knew that all, all a, along. Because, you know, it, it is a kid's show, so maybe oh. they needed to telegraph it a little. But uh, that obvious reveal is made. And then Grievous shows up in the fight. And... He is about to, he's got all of the clone troopers knocked out. He is about to lightsaber uh, Rex's head off when Ahsoka is able to leap in and block it with her lightsaber, which starts a duel between the two of them. They move off into kind of the bowels of the ship and he is stalking her in the dark, basically. And she is completely overmatched, which was very fun to watch. It was, it was scary. It was intense. It was a lightsaber battle, which I've been hoping for more of. Because we haven't seen Ventress since basically the first episode actually do anything. Uh, so that that was great. Rex and his team come to and are instructed they need to just blow the ship anyway. Meanwhile, Obi or Anakin has found R2 after saving him from some battle droids that he fights with. They are all trying to meet up. They get the charges set, Rex's team. They go to the hangar. They meet Anakin, who's there with R2. And Goldie, who has returned. What a dick. I know, but none of them know that he's a bad guy. Ahsoka. dramatic irony. Exactly. Ahsoka, at this point, has figured it out because Grievous told her. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Just to laugh at her. uh, As they continue to fight and stalk. And at one point, he actually grabs her by the throat um, and is about to murder her. And she is able to to distract him kind of momentarily because the the clone troopers just light the, the fuses and blow the ship. And this was a sequence I really enjoyed because the, the battle sphere is floating in atmosphere and they blow it up and it doesn't explode like a Death Star and everything's gone. It's kind of like they blow the engines and it just starts to fall. So they're fighting in it while it's falling. And in that confusion, Ahsoka cuts off yes. Grievous's hand and is, she's then able nice. to bolt out of a, a ventilation shaft, meet up with Anakin and the rest of the clones who are fighting in the hangar bay, and they're fighting a bunch of droids that Goldie has turned on, and now they realize Goldie's a bad guy. But that's a really fun fight sh- sequence, I thought, because it's the battle droid ships that they're fighting with, not just the regular goofy battle droids. So they have a battle to escape, and we also have what we've yes. been building for. What- droid fight! Exactly. It wouldn't be an episode called Duel of the Droids if we didn't get a, a, dro- a droid duel and the best part about it is it has really tense dramatic music and then they just like shoot a bunch of bolts at each other and it's or, chaos or like belly bumpy <laughs> yeah exactly or bump into each other um so they fight for a while basically it concludes in a fantastic way oh my gosh this is my favorite part of the whole episode it, it was so no my second favorite part. goldie's about to fall off 
uh, the the ship as it's falling, and he suction cups himself to R2, who has drenches him in oil, lights him on fire, and then saws through the cord, and you think it's going to be this dramatic he falls off, but he falls maybe a foot, and then gets obliterated by debris, and like breaks <laughs> into a million pieces. <laughs> It's awesome. And then uh, Anakin... It's one of the top moments so far. It's a fantastic death. Goldie probably wins the best death award that we've had in in the show and in a Star Wars movie. And uh, R2 then is able to jump onto Anakin's ship. And they all meet up and they're about to fly off into space. And Obi-Wan again is there to lecture Anakin and tell him about how he risked everyone's lives and blah, 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 blah. feel like he's just going to be like... Oh, yeah, and just because you have all this attachment to R2 and then just destroy R2. Oh, yeah. I feel like I would not be surprised if Obi-Wan did that. Yeah, pretty much. If he was there, he probably would have. And then, uh, you know, he, he shuts off the monitor, and Ahsoka's like, you know, he's kind of right. And then Anakin kind of has this buddy dramatic, yeah, but he's such a good friend we had to do it. And they fly off, and the credits roll, and we completely ignore the fact that Rex's entire platoon was murdered in this mission. <laughs> and we don't care about them at all. They left. No, they were murdered. What? They were murdered in the hallway by the battle droids. Only two of them survived that. Oh, wow. Okay. So I they meant, lost... I know the two, the two go... Okay. So Rex and one other clone trooper out of Got his it. battalion okay. of, you yeah, know, ten guys it. were murdered in this mission to save a droid that Anakin loves more than his orders or anything else. In fairness... But they're buddies fairness, who hug. I, I think all of us like R2 more than those particular clones that died on that ship. So it was... Well, yeah, and, and and maybe we're alluding to what the Jedi really think of the clones. I mean, it's about what Anakin th- or about what Obi Wan thinks of the droids, but Anakin just has an attachment to R two and to Rex. But maybe they just don't care about them and see them as fodder. <laughs> it's interesting because Anakin is closer with R two in this series, but he created C three PO. But R two is Padme's droid, and it was only accidentally Padme's droid. Yeah, but they, they're the ones that spend time together. Because he creates C-3PO as a little kid and then leaves him for 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Where R2's with him that whole time. Or is he? Or does he show up with Padme again when, in yeah. Attack of the Clones? I don't even remember. But then as they go off and they R2 and him do things and C-3PO stays on Coruscant with most Padme. of the time. Yeah, so they, they, they trade off, I guess. Uh, but this was this was such an unexpectedly good yeah. episode for me because yeah. the first part of the arc, neither of us really enjoyed at and, all. And this was the I act- was dreading this. I, I, when I sat down to watch this, I was like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I wasn't looking forward to it at all, and I was ready to be cynical and annoyed, especially because it started out on Gannat's ship with the bad, weird disco rock yeah, music. But then it, but then it like it like switched into a more classical feel like in that song. And I was like, Whoa, wait, yeah. what's going on here? So I wonder, I, I kind of wondered, did they get maybe correction notes to say, Hey, maybe we should liven this arc up a little or serious it up. Or was this the intentional plan all along? Oh. But this, I mean, this episode, like you said, Grievous fighting Ahsoka was dark and scary and horror movie ish. And what we want out of a villain, the battle scenes were exciting and they felt like they served the plot rather than the plot serving the battle sequences, which has been a problem in other episodes, especially the one with C-3PO where they're jumping between trains, which had some fun moments, but it felt like they built that action sequence and then built a story around it, right. where this it felt like they made action sequences that fit the plot and moved, right. moved in that direction. So it was this was a big step up for me and not what I expected and at all. One thing that I will say about this particular crew, about Coleman especially, is the optics are just great. Like, if yeah. you look at how this looks, it looks better than any episode to date. Um, he was really, really skilled with that. The, the details of the, the of the characters and the pop, like, if you look at how he does space, like, the, the stars just pop, and it's just, it's just better. Um, it's just much more skilled. In, in how he presents it. Uh, this is also awesome because the, the character progression for Ahsoka. I mean, Ahsoka, you know, it's the plucky teen character, but straight up, she is in over her head, mm-hmm. is successful, like, essentially defeats Grievous, and yeah. does it on her own. This isn't the Padme save me that we saw earlier. This is her sort of coming into, you know, almost like Luke in uh, in Empire Strikes Back, where, I mean, he, he wasn't victorious, but he got away and faced it and was able to save most of his friends. So, I thought I, it was good this. interaction between her and Rex as well. In the movie, one of the things I liked, and there's not a lot to like about that movie, is the, uh, a scene between her and Rex 
where she kind of shows up as this bratty Jedi kid and says, well, I'm in charge of you because I'm a Jedi. And he kind of is like, no, I'm experienced and know what I'm doing, you mm-hmm. know, and it, it kind of spoke to the privilege of the Jedi versus, you know, the, the clones who are just bred to be their fodder. Right. And they had some good interactions where she does, he doesn't really seem to believe in her leadership when Anakin abandons them and what she's doing. He still follows it to the T does exactly what she says, but you can tell that he's kind of resistant and doesn't trust her. And I like that dynamic. And I was glad to see it return because we haven't had that in the small interactions they've had since the movie. Where do you rate this? Uh, I'm going to put this in. I, I, I'm getting to a point now where I, I don't know if I can give everyone a specific slot. So I keep, because I keep a list the, now. I oh, do you? I should list, probably yeah. start that. I would probably put this in the top, the top three or four. Yeah. I, you know, rookies is still by far the best, but this could, um, this, this could go into number two for me if I really sat down and, th- and thought about it. I, I think there was just a lot to like about this episode and even the things that were goofy about it, I enjoyed. Like how how the droid battle oh. being the highlight because it was it was so, so built good. up dramatically and then just so kind of so kind of a nothing hilarious battle to watch them bump into each other and, and shoot all this stuff at them themselves. It was phenomenal. I gave it third. I have rookies above it. Um, rookies is still my favorite. And then Ambush, the first Oh, yeah, the Yoda, Yoda episode. I really enjoyed that. And and maybe, you know, if I went back and watched, I mean, I would say, you know, like 2A two, two or 2B, um, maybe, but I'm going to rank this third out of the seven that we've we've had so far. You know, you know, I'll say is is this this may not be our liveliest episode we've ever had because we're both tired as fuck. Because we're both tired and and I, I think the high of of last week's episode being so crazy were you has high? worn I mean, us out. No, I I do not do that at all. <laughs> but uh, the uh, next week I think is going to be something really entertaining because man, I saw the description of what that episode is, which I don't normally do, and holy fuck, is this going to be bad? <laughs> Well, all right. Maybe we should uh, head over to uh, other news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what's got the uh, the blood flowing in the veins for you and the uh, other nerd stuff, um, buddy? So we, we mentioned it was Inter- International Women's Day, and uh, we're filming our recording on Friday, and I believe it's... Uh, there, there's a hashtag going around and I should have written it down, but it's well, women in film is kind of the theme. And there is a fantastic documentary. It's an HBO documentary. So if you have HBO go, you have access to it whenever you want called casting by, and it is about the casting world in general in movies. So selecting actors to be in parts and it has a couple casting people it focuses on, but the main one is Marion Doherty. who is kind of the, the queen of, of casting worked for decades and decades in the industry and gave numerous stars that you've heard their start in film industry. So it's a retrospect on her career, the whole industry, and also how underappreciated that industry is. It's the only guild that they don't give an Academy Award to, despite numerous requests to do it. And it really gives you appreciation for how much they bring to movies and how much they bring to what we watch and all enjoy but never get recognized for and she is just this new york sassy badass woman to listen to it it's really really enjoyable you're gonna hate taylor hackford um so never watch ray again after this movie because he comes off as a total dick as our villain in the movie um but it's a really great watch so it's called casting by and it can be found on hbo go sounds interesting i don't have hbo go but if i do someday you can come over and watch it here sometime that sounds really fun um, I am marrying two of my loves, and this happened yesterday, so I'm watching you Old Boy, because, what? Nothing. Shut up. <laughs> God damn it. I'm watching Old Boy, mm-hmm. just because I want to try to, you know, appease you for some stupid reason. And at po- some point, I need the DVD back. No, I'm just watching it on Netflix. Oh, I <laughs> why would I my DVD like, back. Why would I go down to the basement to <laughs> go grab the DVD? That's Touché. stupid. So I'm watching it, and then I started thinking, this is not like Daredevil. I mean, this is this is similar in some respects, but it's not a carbon copy. And that is, it was not the argument that you presented to me so many moons ago. And then I was thinking about Kevin Smith, and I haven't really gotten deep into Kevin Smith's Daredevil run. Like, I've, I kind of went oh. through it, and so I kind of, you know, I've been reading the X-Men and Claremont's run, and so now I'm kind of hopping both back and forth between that and i'm starting kevin smith's uh daredevil run and it's 
interesting to me. It starts off with basically Karen Page is leaving him. She's gone to L.A. to work for, um, I don't know if it's Fisk. I can't remember now. And so he's dealing with that. And then at the end of the comic, he like is like presented with this child, like this baby. And so I'm not sure where it's going to go. And I'm interested. So that's what I'm going to do. Matt, how long an arc did he do on there? Do you know? I'm not really sure. I mean, I think I want to say that he did it up until the, the, when uh, Max started doing the art. So it would be quite a while. But like sure quite a while is in years, you know what, months. I have, I have. We can, we can seriously just pause the podcast. All right, hold on. I right can up. look it up and then All tell right. you exactly. So after deep deliberations with uh, the interwebs, it seems that Kevin Smith only did like eight issues of Daredevil. Oh. So that's kind of anticlimactic. Well, at least you can get through it pretty quickly then. So can you find that on on Comixology or where do you... No, uh, I get Marvel Unlimited. Marvel Unlimited, Unlimited is where you're yeah. reading it through? Yeah, that so. is my, it's my jam. But right after that comes my favorite, favorite arm, artist, uh, uh, Alex Mack. He is the... He's a shit, so... Okay, so if you haven't read Daredevil, which is me, I've never read Daredevil, yep. where where do you go? Do you go to Frank Miller? Where do you start? <sighs> well, the thing is... Or what's the, what's the fascist, art you want to read? If you're a fascist, read... <laughs> Sometimes. He's, he's yeah. deciding what yeah. he is. Um, if you're a fascist, read uh, read Miller. Mm-hmm. Um, if you like get off on like the ultra violence and stuff like that, um, I I recommend reading probably this this volume when, when Kevin Smith starts and then it goes to uh, to Mac and then it goes to Bendis and then it goes to Malie Bendis and Malie and then it uh, goes to Ed Brubaker. And so that's that's where I'd start. start with Kevin Smith and just go on there. It makes makes life easier. Do you know what years? What year did Kevin Smith start doing that? Ninety nine. Okay. But I, I'm just joking about the Miller is a fascist, even though it's totally true. If you, if you really want to understand how Batman became Batman, if you're a Batman fan out there, Miller was basically using Daredevil as to to try out things with the same sort of character before Batman, and then went to Batman and kind of took it to the, the extreme after that. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm ready for this to be over. Let's do it. All right. See ya. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Kids Seriously. This episode was recorded and produced at Camro Studios. Visit our website at www.kidsseriously.wordpress.com or email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Until next time. <laughs>